So I'm Amanda. Uh, my project was on the Aymara birthing experience, and it started as really an, or I wanted to understand the cultural pertinence of the entire maternal health care system, which was ambitious for nine months, much less a lifetime. So <laughs> it ended up being an analysis on a specific program offered in the hospital in Arica for the entire region of Arica and Parinacota. <coughs> Um, I worked with Professor Luis Galdames. He helped me. Um, he helped me with the introduction to the university, with a lot of the IRB requirements. Um, and then my academic mentor was Vivian Gavilan through the anthropology department. I was able to audit her courses um, and really understand the intercultural framework already established in the region, um, as well as have a lot of introductions to the anthropologists in the region, continuing with this work. Um, so a bit of an introduction. Um, under the current sanitary code in Chile, it's effectively illegal to have a home birth. There are um, a lot of exceptions. It's written in a kind of confusing way where people can wiggle around the code. Um, so there's midwives who are able to deliver home births if they're close enough to the hospital and if they have enough equipment. But basically, this norm prevents the birth attendants, who I'm going to call Usuyiris and use their Aymara name, um, from performing their roles as birth attendants. So the system has incorporated them through different ways. And then in 2009, uh, the Arika Health Services Program created a project or an initiative called Utu Sanja Musunya, which I'll talk about what that means in a little bit. Um, and this program is basically an intercultural birthing model. And I'll talk more about what that really means. So I worked in Arica. As you can see, it's very north. Um, it's basically on the border of Peru and Bolivia. And it actually used to be part of Peru until the War of the Pacific. Um, so it's a really unique mix of cultures. And there's a large presence of uh, the indigenous group, the Aymara. Um, and that, that pueblo makes up 13.6% of the total population in the region. And right now, a lot of the population lives in Arica, which is the city, the capital of the region. Um, but also in the interior, there's a lot of small towns and which are largely Aymara as well. And so I did almost all of my work in Arica where the program runs, but um, I did a little bit of field work in Putre as well. So my main objective was to analyze the power dynamics within this birthing program. Um, it balances two models of care, the Occidental Biomedical model, as well as the Aymara um, birthing model. So I wanted to know really how this works in practice and implementation, and think about how are the power dynamics playing out, and how does this impact its ability to be an intercultural program for these women and the families. Um, so more specifically, I wanted to think about this program as part of the public policy under the maternal and child health care system, Chile Crece Contigo. Um, and then I also wanted to examine its interculturality, <laughs> um, which I don't think is a word that exists in English, but in Spanish it does. <laughs> um, and then I'm also, I also wanted to think about the power dynamics, like I said, specifically between the staff, so thinking about the midwives, the doctors, and the usuyiris, the birth attendants, as well as the women who are obviously in the space giving birth. So I, my investigation was qualitative. Um, so I worked with mostly, mostly with women. I really wanted to understand their stories, their experiences. Um, so I did open interviews with program participants. Um, and then I also interviewed a lot of Aymara women to better understand what does an Aymara birth look like within the hospital, but also with um, outside of the hospital, both in the past and present, um, mostly for my own contextualization of the information. Um, I also conducted a lot of interviews with healthcare uh, professionals, so midwives, doctors, um, people who worked at the health services who implemented and created the program, um, and other public health officials. And then I also interviewed um, the birth attendants who are working within the healthcare system, the usuyiris, and one kuyiri yatiri, which is um, basically like a medical doctor within the Aymara healthcare framework. A little bit more context. Um, so there was a period of Chilenization, which 
still, you can still say is happening, but really after the War of the Pacific, when Chile gained the land from Peru and Bolivia, there was a there was a very aggressive and violent time where the indigenous people were, were Chilenized. So they weren't able to speak their indigenous language. Um, a lot of their culture and traditions were lost. Um, also, you can fit the medicalization of birth within this, within this period of Chilenization. Uh, women were required to go to the hospital. Um, home births were illegalized and um, Actually, the police would escort women down. So it was a very top-down, aggressive medicalization of birth. Um, and then also we have a medicalization of birth really all over the world, especially in Occidental countries. And so we have to also think about this program in that context. Um, and then we also see inter-ethnic gaps in health and disease. So within Chile, the indigenous population, so the largest one is Mapuche, um, Aymara is the second largest, um, we see much higher rates of disease, both of chronic disease and of infectious disease. And the government has made it a priority to lower this gap, to increase their health. Um, and so this program is also a way to improve the rates of maternal and maternal, um, infant and maternal health in the region and in the country. Um, Additionally, we have, I'm not going to go through every single law, but we have international policy and national laws that basically require Chile to create intercultural health models. So this is not Chile being nice by creating this program, but it is um, part of the international um, conventions and part of the national policy to create systems and models of care that honor and include the voice of indigenous people um, and that are culturally pertinent and include their forms and systems of care. And I use um, three definitions of interculturality um, to think about intercultural health. <clears throat> so the first anthropologist, Malva Pedrero, she works in Arica um, as well as throughout Chile. And she defines intercultural health as the collective transformation of a system. So she thinks of collectively as including the voice and action of the indigenous populations. So not the government creating the system, but really having it be a collective experience and utilizing the leadership from the indigenous groups. Um, additionally, she mentions that it has to be the whole system. We can't have isolated programs that just have components of interculturality. Um, Catherine Walsh says that an intercultural model can't have one model of care that's subordinate to another. Um, and this makes sense to have something that's intercultural. There needs to be an equal level of power within the models. And then uh, Ramirez, who's in Marires, says um, we have to also recognize that medical pluralism exists in every model of care. Um, so for example, if I, if I get a cold, I might utilize some uh, interventions from uh, biomedicine. I might take certain uh, pills or I might take Advil, but I also might eat soup and drink uh, ginger tea. So we're utilizing a lot of different forms of care um, when we are treating illness. And then also she mentions the, um, the really the need to think about how culture is always changing, how models of care are always transforming with different politics, history, uh, historical events, um, social norms, and, and culture is not obviously stagnant. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about the Occidental birthing model, but um, I want to spend more time on the Aymara birthing model since I think that will be more unfamiliar to you all. Um, so the biomedical model is really seen in a lot of ways as the sole um, proprietor of knowledge, especially um, within Chile. And Menendez, the anthropologist, speaks a lot about that, um, how it's very dominant, especially in Latin America. Um, and so we've also seen medicalization happen um, throughout the world, really, where medical jurisdiction is much more important in many different forms of life. So thinking of birth as not a natural event, but as a medical event in this current age. Then we've also seen biomedicalization, which is thinking of, um, or which describes the introduction of very specific, technical, specialized forms of care. Um, so instead of treating um, an illness and thinking of the person as whole, we're, we're, we're categorizing and, and treating it very um, specifically. 
Um, and so Kleinman also notes the difference between disease and illness. So disease, thinking of pathology, thinking of um, germs and bacteria, instead of thinking of illness as a more integral social cultural experience. And professionals here are obviously learning um, in a university in a very formal manner. Versus the Aymara birthing model um, is very different. It's almost always, or at least traditionally, it was done in the house, um, specifically in the kitchen for reasons of heat. Um, it's a personal and familiar event. Um, it's generally attended by um, multiple family members, although it differs based on the area and uh, the preference of the mother. Um, and so the, the partner generally has a much larger role. Um, sometimes he's there holding the head of the mother so that way the spirit doesn't escape. Um, or sometimes he's the one to actually um, first hold the baby. Generally it's his role to cut the umbilical cord. Um, so a much more dominant presence as well. Um, there's also natural interventions, um, and I say natural as less invasive, less biomedical. So there's a lot of herbs that are used, both in prenatal care as well as after the birth um, and during the birth, specifically oregano, uh, chamomile, um, basil, so herbs that we're also familiar with, and then other ones that, um, such as romero and um, a bunch of others from the Andes. Massages are also used um, to align the baby in the correct way and to prevent um, C-sections. And in a similar vein, um, a use of manteo, which is the use of a blanket to physically turn the fetus um, during the controls is used to, uh, eat, to really facilitate a natural birth, a vaginal birth. Um, there's also precautions with the cold, wind, sun, and exercise. <clears throat> so within the Aymara Co Cosmovision, uh, pregnant women have to take a lot of control not to catch uh, frio, to, to really to catch the cold of the environment. Um, so that's why massages and herbs are also used to continuously heat the body, otherwise the baby will um, go up into the, into the uterus and won't be able to, um, the, the woman won't be able to have a natural birth. Um, additionally, the sun is um, dangerous. One woman in Putre told me that she wasn't able to have a natural birth because the sun dried her placenta and uterus. So women are taking a lot of care not to um, be exposed to the sun. Um, and then women are also constantly walking in order to, to have a natural birth. And then uh, the usuyiri usu uh, is the birth attendant who generally attends. And so this program was created in 2009. Um, by the Arika Health Services, like I mentioned, and it means Utu Sanka Musunya means birth, like in our house. Um, Uta means house, and then Sankham is like, like in our house, like in our house, and then Usunya technically means to enfermarse, to make or to get sick. Um, but within the Aymara Cosmovision, the getting sick and having an illness is almost like being pregnant. It's a state of um, being very fragile. It's, it's very easy to become ill during this time. And so this direct translation actually makes sense within the context. It includes prenatal care, so visits with birth attendants. Um, it includes workshops, so the Usu Yiri gives talks on what, what will this birth look like. Um, Generally, it's done in a vertical or squatting position, so um, she gives examples and, and really makes it clear what's going to happen. And then also, there's a right to having someone always present. So that's the partera or the usuiri, um, or the birth attendant, as well as another, a significant other. So whether that's the partner or, or the mother or a parent uh, who's constantly present. And so, I interviewed formally about 40, 50 people, um, but I, today I'm gonna focus on the stories of the three women who used the program. And more women used the program, but um, not, not very many used the program for reasons that I'm going to discuss later. Um, and so I was able to interview three in depth. And so I'm gonna focus on intercultural health and specifically look at access, authoritative knowledge, biopower and obstetric violence, and I'll define those terms as I go. Um, so my main question is, is this program intercultural? Can we call it an intercultural model? Um, and so based on the two definitions that I used earlier, um, 
I argue that it cannot be considered an intercultural program because it offers incomplete services. Um, two of the women, I think I included the, the quotes, um, but they talk about how after the birth, the birth attendant left and they were treated in the Occidental fashion. So it's there's not a transformation of the entire system, but rather just components integrated into an unchanged medical model. Um, then there's also a poor understanding of the Cosmovision. Um, there's no cultural capacitation for the, for the midwives on this model. Um, that happens on a regular basis. So a lot of the, the midwives are unfamiliar with the program, um, don't fully understand why, why traditions are done in a certain way, which um, prohibits uh, interculturality from really being a core component of the system. And then there's also a lack of a, um, of a companion during the entire process. Several women uh, talked about how there was resistance when they wanted to bring in their usuiri, especially in the beginning, or how she had to leave at certain points. And so while this right is part of the protocol, it's not always implemented. And so I have two quotes to, to show the example of the incomplete services. And so the names are changed, but these are, these are the quotes from the women I interviewed. Uh, Camila said, but in the end, after it was terrible because my child was already born, they took, her to, they took him to weigh him and they came to stitch me up, but it was terrible, terrible, terrible. I feel like as an experience, as work, the program has to be complete, not only in the instance when the baby is born, but also postpartum. And Norma said, and from then on, from when my son was born, I haven't had any more contact with those who were in the program. From then on, I was lost. From then, I returned again to Occidental Medicine. Therefore, there was a doctor, a midwife, everyone, but my Usu Yidi wasn't there. Therefore, the ideal would have, I would have liked for my Usu Yidi to have continued. Um, and then also, there's um, lack of access in the region. Um, very few women actually utilize the program. It's less than one a month. Um, and so there's confusion about the function of the program. A lot of the women I interviewed had misconceptions of the program um, or just didn't know about it at all. <clears throat> and then generally women have to coordinate um, their visits with the Usu Yidi, which can be a barrier to care. Um, the, the number isn't necessarily provided to everyone and they have to call, make that first introduction and then coordinate every single control, which can be a large burden. And then there's also strict protocols. Um, so it's, there's not much flexibility in what the program can look like, either a woman is part of it or not. Um, so if the woman wants to, or chooses to have anesthesia or one component of biomedical care, she has to leave the program entirely and the Usu Yidi can't accompany her in the visits. Um, so that's also a large barrier to access. And so there was one report from the program that created this initiative and it found that 95% of the women that were interviewed, there were 19 women interviewed, um, they found that they were, they did not have enough information. And so this is clearly showing that the year after implementation, there, there really wasn't enough communication about what the program means. Um, then additionally in 2014, another thesis showed that um, over, or about 40% of the population, not, and this was, the population was about 170 women at five different health um, centers. She found that 40% of the women didn't even hear about the program. So that's a pretty large number of women who have no idea the program even exists as an option. And as part of the protocol, every woman should know about it, whether they're Aymara or, or non-Indigenous. Um, every woman has the right to use the services. <laughs> And then also about 50% found that the information was insufficient. So they didn't understand what the program entailed and they felt like they didn't have enough information to make an informed choice. Um, authoritative knowledge is a framework to think about intercultural health. And it basically explains when one voice or one model of care has the authority or power over another. Um, and so in this instance, the doctor um, from all of my interviews seem to have the most power, which makes sense given the biomedical framework. Um, then the birth or then the midwife and then the birth attendant or the woman. Um, and so there were four reasons or there were four examples of this authoritative knowledge within the healthcare system. Um, there was resistance and refusal, which I think is my example. So I'll talk about that in a second. Um, there was also an underestimation and devaluation of what an Aymara birth looked like. 
Um, so a lot of the women would say that they asked for an Aymara birth and the midwives were very resistant um, to even call it an Aymara birth. They would intentionally use the word natural birth even when the woman continued to correct them. Um, so there was this underappreciation for what it meant to give, an, to give birth in an Aymara fashion. Um, additionally, the midwives would sometimes prohibit certain herbs because they didn't know the effects of them. So they were taking on the control and the authority to decide the form of care rather than learning about the different ways of, of care and, and seeing the effects before making those, um, those recommendations. And then also the, the partera, the usuiri, wasn't the one to actually deliver the baby. So she did all of the prenatal care, but when it came time for birth, it was the midwife who entered the, the room. So clearly there's an authority, there's the authority given to the mat matrona in this example. And so Maria said, um, also with my daughter, I had an impasse that happened when I entered for prepartum. The midwife on call did not want to attend me with an Aymara birth, and I demanded an Aymara birth or I would return to my house. Therefore, I said, I came with my mom and I came with the herbs and everything. I have my birth here or I will have my birth at home, but I will have an Aymara birth. And this is the problem with the older Occidental midwives who are not open to the possibility of Aymara birth. So clearly in this example, the midwife is not trained and nor open to the Aymara model of care. Perfect. Um, and then we also see biopower. So this is um, a framework to think about how the state controls and regulates our bodies and natural um, processes as well as our health. And so we see the hospital with very strict protocols. Um, women are forced to actually sign documents that give consent to the health professionals and not to their own understandings of birth or the usuyiri's understanding of birth. Um, and then we also see the role of the mother being transformed into a patient rather than an active participant in her birthing experience. Women are also required to travel from the interior, from Putre to Arica. Um, which is a stamp state mandate. And then we also see the physical control of the placenta. Um, we also see obstetric violence. Um, so this, is, this can be defined as limiting the agency of a woman to control her own body or birthing experience. Um, we see a lot of dismissive language and underestimation. Um, so a lot of the midwives will actively say, oh, you can't have a natural birth, it's too difficult, and, and underestimating what she can do. Um, there's a lack of privacy, which I have a quote from. Um, there aren't very many options for pain management, and so women are forced under the biomedical system of care rather than having the choices. And then there's also poor communication about why certain in interventions are done. And so in the context of this birthing initiative, um, Camila talked about how she felt like it was a, sh a show, and she began to feel pain because she realized that everyone was surrounding her. Um, and then Norma also talked about how it felt like a spectacle, a show. So there's clearly a lack of respect within this birthing model. Um, a few points of progress. Um, the fact that there is this option is a strength. Um, the Usuyiris are employed by the system, which helps with sustainability efforts. Um, and then we're also seeing some more empathy being built into the system. A lot of the midwives and the doctors uh, talked about how they've seen changes over the past 20 years. Um, and then there's also, of course, the possibility of reclaiming identity. And a lot of women talked about how this was a very tangible way to connect to their indigenous roots. So the possibility to reclaim their indigenous identity through this transformative experience is a huge strength. Um, and then as far as recommendations, um, there need to be complete services given the examples that we've seen. Um, there need to be improved communication efforts as far as accessibility, coordination between the different health centers in the hospital, um, as well as within the different regions, because um, there were oftentimes conflicts and uh, misunderstandings of what the program meant and how the women could prepare for that. Um, the a right to have a companion in the room needs to be taken seriously. Um, and then there also needs to be better preparation for the natural birth. Um, an improvement of the physical space. A lot of the women talked about the lack of privacy, about the, about the physical um, constraints of having a very small room to give birth in rather than a larger space like in a home. Um, to have more agency and respect around their birthing options. Um, 
and having frequent cultural capacitation for the healthcare providers. Um, there's a new protocol around the placenta, so I think having constant monitoring to make sure that the health professionals are respecting that protocol is very important. Um, and then having more options that are evidence-based um, and more flexibility within the program itself for women to design how they want their birth to be. And then lastly, um, in conclusion, while this program is a huge strength for the region, it can't be considered intercultural due to the power the biomedical field has on the program. Um, and it, given the recommendations I gave on the last slide, which are all driven from the stories and experiences of the women, um, there can be improvements made to the system and to the program to make it more intercultural. Um, and then lastly, this program is only part of the entire maternal health care system. <clears throat> and a lot of women who I talked to had very horrific experiences of violence and trauma within their birth. And so there needs to be a, really a complete analysis of the entire system. Um, and thinking back to Ped Pedrero's um, definition of interculturality as a transformation of the system and not just a program. And so here are some resources if you want to read more. And that's it. <laughs> Taking one question. Yeah. Yeah. Could could you elaborate what you were talking about with the placenta? You didn't go into oh, that. Oh yeah. What what is the issue there? For as far as the new protocol. Right. Oh yeah. So as far as the placenta within um, the Aymara Cosmovision, it has a lot of significance. Oftentimes they'll dry it and use it as a treatment, or they'll they'll bury it as a symbol to protect the baby and the mother from illness. And so in the past, before April of 2017, um, there, was, there wasn't a formal protocol to bring home the placenta. Mm -hmm. And so now there is, which is a huge advancement. Um, but it's, right now it's starting to be implemented. Um, and so just given the, the, what we know about the hospital and, and the medical staff of not being particularly receptive to Aymara practices, um, I think it would be really important to think about um, not just having a, sh a protocol for for bringing home the placenta, but making sure that the healthcare mm -hmm. professionals are really offering it as an option, mm -hmm. um, and making sure to do follow up work to making to to see if it's an actual valid option for women to take home their placenta. So with the, with a lot of this, I, I I see sort of the incorporation of two uh, cosmic visions. One is the Western sort of like we're very scientific mm -hmm. and germs and let's be saying on the other side you have like you know important uh, herbs and like comfort and like rituals that clearly have you know years and years of millennia of tradition mm -hmm. that you know they've been working so far mm -hmm. um so what do you think like uh i, I guess my, my question kind of goes like what other traditions have also kind of fallen by the way that's that's too broad of a question that's too broad of a question but is, is there a possibility that other things besides besides the do you believe of other sorts of birthing options for not even indigenous, but like, uh, like old school like Christianity rituals, you know what mm. I mean? Do you think like this would be an important um, Yeah, so I think, um, I don't know if I'm going to answer your question exactly, but I think in general, within the current system that Chile has, and I think um, a lot of the world has, there's really one, only one option for your birthing experience, and it's the biomedical framework. Um, so right now, there's a lot of political activism in Chile um, to create a new law to prevent obstetric violence, which basically means the woman should be the protagonist of her birthing experience. So whether that means she wants to have a home birth, a water birth, um, or an Aymara birth, she can choose that if she's if she knows the risks and um, and if there's a protocol in place to for if there is an emergency how do you still improve health outcomes um, while respecting the woman's choice for her birthing experience. So I think there's room to create a system with a bunch of different options that honors birthing experiences from, for example, the African population that's in Arica, um, to the Aymara population, to the Quechua population, to the Mapuche, Rapa Nui, there's a lot of indigenous groups with different experiences. Um, so having a system that could complement and incorporate many different forms of care would be needed. Can I help on that, or are we out of time? Uh, what do you say, Lauren? Go for it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I 
it's not fascinating. It seems like these two, like the, the biomedical approach and the modern approach, are very polar ones, mm -hmm. holistic ones, very scientific. But where they are the same is they both see it as a sickness, which I found very surprising. Mm. Do you know of any birthing uh, cosmovisions or, or a culture that sees a more yeah. of a celebration of a, of a good thing rather than like yeah. we're sick and we need to have a birth? Yeah, I think the natural birthing movement is definitely trying to reclaim birth as a positive, transformative experience rather than um, like an experience where you're sick or fragile, um, and then, yeah, having the birth or the, the baby expelled to, to become well again. Um, also, the, we've something that's been really interesting is several of the Usuiris who work within the medical system right now have also seemed to change their, their understanding or cosmovision of birth to mirror this natural birthing um, reclamation. And so one of the Usu Yiris in, in a documentary talked about how birth isn't a sickness and how it's a natural process. Um, so I think maybe that could be because of the juxtaposition of care of this birthing model within the hospital and having it be as an, like, the only alternative um, could kind of make it, and I think especially in Eureka, it's combined a lot with this natural birthing energy. And so I think even within the Aymara Cosmovision, it's st starting to change a little bit more into this healthy, natural experience rather than as pregnancy as an illness. Um, and then a lot of the women also spoke about their experience as a very natural, beautiful process. So I think even if you think of pregnancy as more of a, a sickness or an illness, um, or as a dangerous period of time, the actual birth is still a beautiful experience within the Aymara Cosmovision. It's just they understand the risks that are involved in the pregnancy and the birthing process. One, one last super quick question. Where, where are the geographical parameters of this program? Does it only exist in, in Arica or within Tarapacá or? Just the Arica Parinacota region. Okay.